Next up, we have Michael. And so I asked Michael for some, for some little known facts about himself and uh, some of the things he came up with. Uh, he likes rock climbing. He has a degree in maths. Uh, he used to work with someone named Matt and he does not have a hamster uh, named Blockchain. So everybody, let's give Matt a round of, Michael a round of applause. Great, hi everyone. So, yep, my name is Michael Slowinski. I'm a data scientist at Silence. Uh, and today I'll, be, today I'll be talking to you guys about a vectorization technique, really. Uh, so it's applications of graph integration to function comparison and uh, malware classification. So the graph integration part is really a vectorization technique. So uh, you can stack any kind of uh, machine learning algorithm on the back of this that you want. So we happen to use a random forest just to test this out, just to uh, validate it. Uh, but you can, uh, I'm sure you could use any kind of uh, uh, learning algorithm that you chose. And this work was done together with Andy Wartman, uh, who's actually no longer at Silence, but he's, if anybody's looking for a security researcher, he's one of the best that I've, I've, uh, I've, ever, I've ever worked with. And he's the one who developed the uh, decompiler that we used uh, for the initial vectorization. Okay, so uh, the, ad the agenda. So first I'll give you guys an overview of this vectorization method. Uh, and we're, we're vectorizing a .NET. Okay, sure. Okay. So we're, vectori we're vectorizing .NET. And the reason for this was uh, a few years ago at Silence, uh, .NET was one of the file types that we were, our main model was missing quite a bit on. So we decided to build a model based on decompilation as opposed to the, the, the normal um, static analysis where you just, this is static too, but where you uh, have a parser in a very, very high dimensional space and then build some kind of a, uh, an algorithm on top of that. So I'll talk a little bit about the .NET framework and the common language runtime uh, because that's our, like I said, our data is .NET. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, decompilation. And it's from decompilation that we get the graphs that we, uh, uh, on which we define our functions, and then uh, those are the functions that we take the antiderivatives of to, uh, uh, to vectorize these files, okay? And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, results. Okay, so an overview of the vectorization method. So again, our overall goal is to construct a vectorization method uh, to be leveraged by a classifier on .NET files. So this is a classifier for, it's a benign malicious classifier, just a two-class classifier, okay? So our vectorization method. So what we do first is we decompile our file, all, again, always .NET, and this results in a set of graphs, which I'll describe uh, in a bit. We then, decide, we then uh, define a set of functions, not to be confused with the functions that constitute the file, but uh, hand-designed functions defined on the vertex sets of these direct directed graphs, functions to uh, the real numbers. And these functions are applicable to every possible graph uh, coming out of decompilation. Okay, so they, they, can be, they can be applied, sometimes vacuously so, to any graph that we get. Uh, so then we, we then compute, and we'll, I'll define what this means, we'll compute antiderivatives of these functions defined in the previous step. Okay. And then because we get many, many graphs, sometimes as many as 10 to the 5 graphs per file, uh, we need to kind of combine these values so that we end up with a single uh, vector for a single file, right? So we'll compute, we'll com we'll compute component-wise uh, mean and standard deviations of these antiderivative components across all of the graphs uh, resulting from decompilation of that given file. Okay, so just a little bit about not .NET, if you guys are not familiar. So .NET is really made up of two components. Uh, so the first is the framework class library. So this is just uh, a library implementing functions and methods for uh, doing user interface, uh, data access, database connectivity, cryptography, uh, web app development as well. And then the important part is the common language runtime. So this is a managed language. So anything that you write, say in C Sharp or F Sharp or Visual Basic or whatever, will get compiled into some intermediate language and then uh, jitted. Uh, into machine code, so let me just go through that. So the common language runtime is an application virtual machine, which provides some very nice services. So this includes security, memory management, uh, exception handling, anybody who's written C++ knows that it's uh, a lot easier to work with C Sharp where you don't have to worry about uh, dereferencing de things so you don't waste memory. Uh, and then a compilation of high-level .NET code like C Sharp uh, results in an intermediate language binary, 
And then the, the uh, common language runtime JITS, or just-in-time, compiles this code from the intermediate language to machine code, uh, which is actually run on the CPU. OK, now decompilation. So just, just uh, again, our vectorization method involves taking .NET files, compiled binaries, <laughs> decompiling them, extracting graphs, and then vectorizing these graphs. So what is decompilation? This is just a program transformation by which uh, compiled code, so this binary code is transformed into some high-level human readable form. And the form that it takes with our decompiler is, uh, is twofold. So it's the, function, it's the function call graph, and it's also the, uh, the set of abstract syntax trees, where you get one of those per function constituting the file. So what is an abstract syntax tree? So this is just a tree representation of the abstract syntactic structure of the source code, where each node denotes a construct occurring in the source code. And I'll go into that later, like a, a while loop or a declaration or something like that. Okay. So program control flow then is understood by studying the structure of uh, the two types of graphs that I just mentioned. <clears throat> so the first is our function call graph, uh, which does exactly what you think it does. It describes the calling structure of the functions or subroutines uh, constituting the overall program. And we we experimented with this, and there is, there's a lot of very useful data in the function call graph, but for the sake of this work, we'll only be focusing on the following kind of graph. So we call this the short-sighted data flow graphs. So each of these is obtained by merging all paths through the given AST corresponding to a constituent function. So again, we have one of these SD, SDFG graphs uh, per function in the file, right? It's function in the file. We decompile, we, that gives us the AST, and then we construct these SDFGs. Okay, so just a little, kind of a toy example of an ab abstract syntax tree in general from a more mathematical point of view. So let's say we have the following binary operation, binary op expressions, so just numbers that you're combining with uh, binary ops, like multiplication, mod, or plus. And so the semantic structure of this expression can be distilled by considering this thing as a tree, right? the simple tree here, where in this case you're reading this from, uh, um, from leaves to root, so from bottom to top, where you can see that all you're doing is you're combining um, these numbers, given the binary operation, in a specific order. Okay? So what is, the semantic, what is the semantic structure distilled by this expression? It's just the order of operations that everybody's familiar with. Okay. Now, in the case of uh, our ASTs arising from decompilation, each of these nodes contains a lot more information. So instead of just being like a binary op or a literal, as in, as in this case, there's a lot of metadata, uh, depending on what the, uh, what the code construct is that sits at that node. So let's run through a kind of a, an abridged version of our CLR AST dictionary. So again, these are just the constructs that occur at the nodes of our ASTs. And a, uh, a complete version uh, sits in the appendix of the corresponding paper. So the, these, these constructs fall into one of three categories. The first is control flow. So these are things like ifs or elses or breaks uh, or while loops. Oh, and just a note. So everything in blue and it goes into more detail in this in the appendix, but everything in blue is a CLR-specific uh, construct, although that's not really necessary for this talk. Uh, the second category is that of expression. So this is code that, when evaluated, does indeed yield a value. Okay? So valid, this is valid in places such as tests, for loops, conditionals, or uh, uh, what's it say, on the right-hand side of assignments. Right? So two examples here are the binary op, uh, kind of a toy example we saw on the previous slide, or a call. Right? And so, like I said before, there's a lot of metadata occurring at each node of these ASTs. So in the case of, for example, the call, there might be an enumeration of the arguments passed to that function, the function being called, um, well, referencing the call that's uh, sitting at that node of the AST. And then statements. So these, this is code that, when evaluated, does not yield a value. So this is uh, like a, uh, so for example, a statement cannot be on the right-hand side of an assignment. Uh, two examples of statements are assignment or CLR variable with initializer, and this is just a declaration and then a subsequent initialization. Okay, so like you're, you're, you're declaring some variable and maybe it's in the form of some uh, class and you initialize that class. Okay, so how do we actually construct these short-sighted data flow graphs from the ASTs? Okay, so let's look at this simple code block. So 
uh, here you can see that there are two possible execution paths through this code. So you can go from foo to bar to blah, or you can go from foo to baz to blah. Okay? And all we do, as I said before, to construct the SDFG is take both of these paths and merge them together. Okay? So in this case, you get this little diamond-shaped graph, uh, which is always directed, right? because we're looking at execution paths through the code. So it's naturally a directed graph. OK. So what we do next and this is kind of a, a, a theme that recurs in mathematics all the time, is that you very often study an object by studying the set of functions defined on that object. So often you'll see something like a, a vector space and you study the dual. Or maybe you'll see like a, a tangent space and you'll study the cotangent space if you're, say, mapping between manifolds or something like that. Okay, so just two simple examples. So let's say you want, you have a distribution and a sample, sta sample space omega defined by some measure mu. So we might choose to study this distribution by studying these sets of functions, right? So this set of functions it just corresponds to the set of moments defined on, um, uh, on omega uh, describing D. Or you might have a set of matrices. And so in this case, a set of n by n matrices, uh, GLF, over some field. And we might choose to study that set of uh, matrices by studying these two very familiar functions on, uh, on that set of matrices, the trace and the determinant. Okay, so again, is the idea is to study an object by studying the functions defined on that object. Okay, where in this case, the objects are these short-sighted data flow graphs. Okay, okay so let's let G be uh, one of these graphs resulting from an AST. And let's see what kind of an actual function we can define on such a thing. So let's call this one numpass to call. Okay, so let's say we have our, our SDFG uh, graph G resulting from an AST. What's a very simple function we can define? Well, we can map every vertex to the number of arguments passed to the function at that vertex, right? And if, there is, uh, if there's no function being called at that vertex of the, of the AST, we simply map V to zero. <coughs> Where again, uh, this is, uh, args is just the number of arguments passed to that function uh, being called at V. So you can think of this, and really it's just as a feature extraction. Okay, for given the metadata at that node, this is essentially a feature map. So other examples might be, well, maybe you have a, uh, a node where there's a binary op going on. So you can define a function, might as well call it binary op, where we map V to some string to float hash on which op code is being used, right? Now this, is, this seems like a, a somewhat of a silly thing because you're mapping, say, a string to the real numbers. But depending on the kind of uh, um, machine learning algorithm you're using, right, if you're using something like a tree, you might as well think of the real numbers as being a perfectly fine place to hold categorical vari variables if they're, if they're, say, floats, right? Because that tree algorithm ultimately is just a learned set of if-else trees, right? So it's, it's, it's perfectly intuitive to uh, think of this as a, um, it's perfectly legitimate to, uh, to engineer such a feature. Or you might have something like this. You might, have, uh, you might want to define a function where you're looking at the class being referenced at a, um, uh, at a given node. Okay? So again, here, if there is no class being referenced at that node, you simply map v to 0. Okay. Now, what we ultimately want to do is define an, a graph antiderivative of these functions. Okay, so what are the ingredients we need to do that? So in order to define an integral, and this is just in general, of a function uh, defined on some vertex set of the graph uh, for G directed, uh, we must define some measure, mu, on the vertex set. So in other words, some way of assigning weight to each vertex. Okay? in such a way that f is measurable. And if you guys don't, 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 aren't familiar with that, it's not necessary. Uh, it's also trivial in this case because the vertex set of G is uh, finite. So the way we do this is we impose a Markov chain structure on G, right? And we take mu, our measure, to be the page rank measure. And I'll, I'll go into more detail there. So, and again, for those of you guys who are not familiar, the page rank vector is just the steady state probability distribution over the nodes resulting from some long run behavior of a random walk a Markov chain. So you just imagine, imagine a, dir a directed graph and walking, and walking over it 
over and over and over and over again in a, in a specified way. And then you're trying to understand the unconditional probability of being at any given node. Okay, so now we can... <coughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, Markov chains. So a discrete time Markov chain is just a sequence of random variables uh, indexed by the natural numbers. And it has this memoryless property. So the conditional probability of future states is a function only of where you are now, of the current state, as opposed to, as opposed to the entire path of where you've been. Okay. So this is how we, we define this probability transition matrix. So given G, we order our vertex v, uh, vertices V of the graph and define an n by n probability matrix T by, uh, in this way. So all this means is that if you're at a given vertex, uh, the probability over of where you're going to go next over the outgoing edges is uniform. Okay, so if I have two outgoing edges, it's 50-50 of which of whether I walk to this node or whether I walk to that node. Okay. And then we have to do one trick. We have to take this probability transition matrix and smooth it a bit. Right? And the reason for this, let me just write, open this all up. So we have to smooth our probability transi transition matrix by this matrix B. And the reason for this is that in order to guarantee our page rank vector exists, that is, we want to guarantee the existence of an eigenvalue one eigenvector. And the only way that you can guarantee that is if your transition matrix is um, irreducible. Okay? Another way to say that is that the graph is strongly connected. So what that means is that you can get from any, any, any uh, node in the graph to any other node. So an example of, of, of a graph that is not strongly connected would be something that's just, say, linear, with all of your edges pointing in the same direction, because you couldn't get from the end to anywhere else. Okay, okay now finally, the page rank measure. So the page rank measure, as I said, is given by the uh, left eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 of this um, smooth matrix. And it corresponds to, to this limit. So the way to think about this is that you just keep applying your probability transition matrix to the uniform distribution over the nodes over and over and over and over again, okay? And then that steady state vector, that steady state vector, which doesn't, doesn't change upon further applications of M, clearly corresponds to an eigenvector with eigenvalue one because it isn't changing, okay? And what's nice is that this is pretty easy to compute. Um, and I think this is actually the way that network X in Python computes this is rather than um, going through the whole business of trying to find all of the eigenvectors in kind of the normal way, you can just apply this matrix. Uh, and I've usually, I've, I found this, you can get um, a greater approximation applying this even like 10 times or even less sometimes. And then the corresponding Markov chain is given by this. So you have your normal probability transition matrix. Uh, with a weight where P is usually taken to be like 0.15. So uh, the, uh, the original Google uh, PageRank uh, paper, I think, takes this, takes this little P, this guy here, uh, to be 0.15. And this is the probability that you go from any node to any other random node, uh, any other node randomly, right? And so that's, that's what really gives you that strongly connected property. Okay. And you can see what happens here. So if I change the topology, or you can also say the combinatorial, combinatorial structure of the graph, it changes this, this, uh, the measure of the nodes, right? It changes the long run probability of being at any given node, which makes sense, right? If you have fewer or more places to go, the, uh, the steady state vector, the steady state probability vector will be different. Okay, okay now finally the graph integral. So let's say we have one of these functions like num pass to call, where I say, well, how many, how many arguments are being passed to the function at this node? Something like that. So let's let P be the page rank uh, measure. We can then define a new measure on the vertex set this way, okay? Where this integral is defined in the way that's, it's always defined in probability, where uh, the, oh, and I'm sorry, so S is a subset of the node, uh, some any subset of the nodes, right? And the way I define this integral is the way I define any integral in, uh, in probability is where I just take a weighted average of the outcomes. So the outcomes here are alpha, and the weight is just the measure of the uh, pullback of that, um, of that outcome intersected with S, right? Now that looks a little bit strange, but if you, if you uh, rewrite terms, you just get this. What's really nice about this is this is just the dot product of my function f, 
restricted to S with the set of page rank values in S. Okay? So when you're actually coding this up and computing this, all you're doing is taking dot products. That's it. Okay. So how do we think of this graph on a derivative? Well, let's let script P be a partition of 0, 1. And let's look at these sets G, Q. So these are the set, these are the, uh, the vertices in our graph whose page rank is less than Q. Okay? So let's say I set Q to be like 0.1 or something. Then G, Q would be all the vertices with page rank value less than 0.1. In other words, unconditional probability less than 0.1. So this yields, uh, this yields a filtration of subsets of the vertex set, right? So if I keep raising Q, then more and more, more and more uh, vertices will have page rank value less than that threshold, the higher and higher I go. And so once I get to one, then I'll have the entire vertex set. Okay. Now the way we define our, our actual graph and I derivative is uh, capital F of little f is this way. So all it is is a sequence of the measure new applied to this filtration, okay? And the important line here, the intuitive line, is the very last line, right? So you can see from here, the way we've defined this measure just as a dot product, well, this is nothing more than the expected value of my function restricted to that node subset, okay? Now, because our measure is given by the page rank vector, which is defined from a random walk, we can think of the functions of our file as Markov chains that are always running. That are, you just think of this, you think of um, the random walk as being given by these functions being called over and over and over and over again. So what this graph and I derivative really tells you is the expected long run behavior of, your, of the functions constituting your file, and therefore it gives you an expected uh, an expected value with respect to this, this given little function f of the, of the long run behavior of your entire file. Okay, and that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, uh, the intuitive point of view on what this graph and antiderivative is actually doing. Okay, so let's visualize what this looks like. So here's our graph, and I've color coded the nodes, uh, uh, basically heat, heat map color coded the nodes based on page rank. So the blue nodes are the least likely nodes. So again, imagine just a, a random walk that's been running forever, and think about the probability of uh, taking a snapshot of this graph and saying, okay, where am I on the graph? The blue nodes, you're least likely to find the walker there. Then the green, then, um, uh, then yellow, and then red is where you're most likely to find a random walker. Right, so I think this is a, uh, so for example, let's say you had function calls happening at the red nodes, right? So you're, you're much more likely, if, if you kind of randomly observe this file running, you're much more likely to observe, say, v7 being called, as opposed to if there's a function being called at, say, v1. And this is eventually how we distinguish uh, benign files from uh, malicious. So imagine we have one of these functions that I described before, where you're mapping the node set, or you're kind of ignoring the edges other than the page rank. You're mapping just this, the, the node set of, uh, of the graph to the real numbers. And then when you take this antiderivative, you're really thinking about transforming this map into another much simpler map. So now, instead of mapping from the graph to your real numbers, you're mapping from your partition to the real numbers. Okay? So where you have one value, you have one element in that vector from the previous slide per element of your partition. So let's say you've broken up your, uh, broken up zero, one into say 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0.9. Then your resulting vector, when you're vectorizing this graph, will only have three components, no matter how big, no matter how big the graph is. Right? So it's a really nice way, because often when you're embedding graphs, you have this problem that, well, all of my graphs have a, a different number of nodes. They're all a different shape. Right? So this is a very nice way of defining ahead of time, before you've seen a single graph, how long you want your vectors to be so that you can organize them into a nice table and do ML. And so for people who are kind of like more symbols and mathy porn type stuff like I do, you can think of this antiderivative as yet another map where you're taking pairs, where you have uh, your directed graph G and a, one of these functions that we've defined, little f, and you map that to your antiderivative, which again is a function from your uh, partition of 0, 1 to these expected values. 
where again, when you see that expected value, think about um, the expected uh, functionality of the file. Okay, so let's look at a concrete example. So let's say we have an F SDFG given this way. So this is just that diamond graph again. So V1 goes to V2, goes to V3, and then uh, V2 and V3 both go to V4. So it goes out and then comes back in. And I'm not exactly sure if these are the correct page rank values, but uh, let's, just, uh, let's just assume they are. Uh, yeah, as long as they add up to one. So assume that at, at nodes V1 and V4, uh, both correspond to function calls, uh, phi vi, where args vi represents the, the set of arguments being passed to phi vi. Okay. And again, here's our function num pass to call, which is just one of the many functions that we defined for this project. Okay. And again, v just maps to the number of arguments being called uh, at that node. And if there is no function call in that, in that AST node, you just map vi to zero. Okay. So let's let p be this uh, partition of zero, one. Very small partition. Okay, then our graph antiderivative just looks like this. It's just a sequence of three dot products, where we take the, uh, the dot product of the page rank values at the relevant nodes with how many arguments are being passed uh, to the function at either v1 or v4. Okay, so again, computing this is super trivial. And you can do this in parallel too, right? Because you can take, um, you can kind of do these all together since all you're doing is, is looking at um, is, well, I won't get into that, but you can, you can kind of put, you can put all of this stuff into like a, a NumPy tensor and, and kind of compute this for all of the functions and all of the graphs that you have at once. Okay, so let's look at some results. Okay, so let's look at this first, uh, this first image. So it's obviously an image of two uh, distributions, but distributions of what? So let's first look at this function. Uh, a class ref name. So all this is doing is mapping my vertex to the name of the class being referenced in that in the AST at that vertex v. Okay. And again, if there is no class being referenced at that vertex, then you just map uh, v to zero. I uh, I integrate this function from zero to 0.6, and then I merge by taking uh, means and standard deviations across all of the functions in my given file, and that gives me a single value for uh, a given file. And then I plot that, uh, I look at a histogram of those values for benign files and malicious files. And what you can see is uh, two distributions that are relatively well separated, right? So if you only had, you know, if you're trying to build a model on just this one feature, you wouldn't do very well because of that overlap. But if you add a few dozen features that have this degree of separation, uh, another way of saying that is uh, this uh, um, value of the AUC, uh, or if you're looking at, a, looking at it in terms of a rock curve, the, then you'll be in pretty good shape. And what you'll notice is that the variance of this value with respect to malware is a lot higher. And that's something that we observed uh, in our data, that with these kinds of features, the variance for the malware uh, was quite a bit larger than for uh, the benign files. So here are two more, just to give you guys two more examples. So on the upper right, uh, we have uh, CLR literal. So this is just a function which maps each, each vertex to the type of the literal that sits at that node of the AST. And then we integrate that. And again, if there is no literal at that node, we simply map v to a zero. Okay. We do a simple, uh, similar thing here where we have, we're looking at the type of the argument being referenced at v. Right. So that's, that's our function, uh, our graph type. We integrate that from zero to 0.95 do that same aggregation and look at the values for benign files as opposed to malicious. And looking at a few of these in terms of their rock curves, you know, it's, these are actually, these are actually pretty solid because ordinarily if you have a, as, as you guys have, uh, I'm sure, worked with this, that if you have your typical static classifier built on top of a parser, you'll have some number of features on the order of maybe 10 to the 6. Right? And you can achieve 99% plus accuracy with that, but each of those features really won't tell you very much. So if you were to look at the, uh, the rock curves for each of those columns, you'd probably get the vast majority of them along the diagonal here. But even here, just with, with, with these simple features, you get pretty, pretty high AUC values just here. And this is what, was, what allowed us to build a random forest on our .NET corpus, where it was relatively evenly split, so basically, uh, what, 60-40, on about a million samples, right, we were able to get 98.3% uh, accuracy on the test set. 
Okay? And what's especially impressive about this was that the feature space was in, on the order of 10 to the 2, as opposed to being on the order of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. Okay? So it's not, you know, it's 98.3 as opposed to something that you'd, that you'd see commercially available that's, you know, 99.5, 99.5 plus. Uh, but we were still in the 98 range with, with a number of features that you could actually analyze by hand if you wanted to. Okay. And just for comparison, we did a text-only uh, text vectorization where we didn't do any of this integration stuff, but we simply took uh, the metadata available in the ASTs and built essentially a bag of words model on that. Okay. And, you see, and you can still see that you get decent accuracy there because you know, the textual information with respect to you know, what literals are there, what functions are being called, or what, um, what classes there are on the file are very indicative of whether it's benign or malicious. But that extra 10% we got from understanding the, um, the combinatorial graph structure of the graphs as assembled from these ASTs. Okay. Uh, and with that, I'll ask for questions.